All right, everyone, I might, I might get started. Uh, I am from government, so, you know, be nice to me if you can. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so basically, look, to build, to build a good website, we need good content. Um, although, as we've found some, in some cases, how about any content? Because uh, content seems to be never delivered on time. Uh, it, late content is certainly something that my web team has faced, and uh, I really doubt that we're alone. So uh, what can we do about it? Uh, how can we improve the odds in our favour? Through necessity, we recently had to find a way to make the content development process better, much better. At its core, this is a story about how we've tricked ourselves into thinking that email is the answer to everything, and how using the right tool can save money and deliver better content, and most importantly, keep the web team sane. So the APVMA, uh, I don't know if before, the Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority, uh, we've faced some big changes in, in recent times. Uh, in the middle of last year, new legislation commenced that fundamentally changed how we conduct our chemical registration business. Uh, and so fundamental changes, that's web team code for a shit ton of content development. <laughs> so basically all of our content needed to be touched in some way. Uh, a lot was written from scratch, but there was a lot more that needed to be uh, reviewed and redeveloped. We had this additional complexity is that of where we were, uh, we were redeveloping our website at the same time. So new content, new website, it was all going to happen at once. And for us, we were coming out of the Stone Age. We'd been managing our website uh, with Dreamweaver. Um, this is a site with, uh, that had over... I mean, it was somewhere like 12,000 files or something like that. Uh, so it was a bit of a nightmare. And so we're pulling ourselves into the new and exciting world of having a content management system. And luckily for me, that was Drupal. Um, I got to Drupal by uh, walking to the executive and saying, the, the first recommendation from this consultant, it's, it's off the shelf and it's giving me $100,000. Can I use Drupal? And they said yes. So that was really good for us. But there was a further challenge that undermined, underlined everything that we did on this project. And uh, effectively, that was that in a general sense, content management at the APVMA was uh, very immature. Um, content didn't have a business owner, let alone a review date. Uh, so it was effectively unmanaged. So for that reason, it was always going to be a challenging project. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself, ahead of myself a little bit. Um, what's wrong with email anyway? Now, everyone complains about email. Although, that's what I thought before I joined the public sector. In government, we just don't seem to get exposed to the tools that are being used outside in the wider world. And I suspect tools that are familiar to most of you. So tools like Slack, HitChat, Basecamp, Google Docs, whatever it is. In government, we, we don't get to use any of those tools, mostly because they're cloud-based. So those tools are all designed to help with like doing, you know, and solving a specific problem. Um, but because we can't use them in government, perhaps that's why we just generally accept that email is the default way to do things. Email is available. There is no resistance. You can start using it right now. Uh, I suspect some of you are sitting on your email right now. Or is anyone, is anyone sitting on Slack right now? Because I'd be really jealous if you were. <sighs> if only. If only. Uh, so, I mean, look, there's plenty of information. Probably everyone in this room has a, has a sense for what's wrong with email. Um, so I'll try not to climb any further up the soapbox, but effectively, uh, for the purpose of what I'm talking about today, we need to remember a few things. You know, email is a, it's a communication tool from one person to another. It has no context of what's happened before it. Uh, there's no workflow built in, and there's no single source of truth. Everyone involved has the same copy. So the first case study I want to talk to you about, in late 2013, uh, the APVMA was knee-deep in developing about 400,000 words of content. Uh, this was the brand new content for the new site, and there was a small team uh, within the organisation that was writing the whole lot. Now that team was also responsible for the multi-step workflow uh, to get that content from, from the point of drafting all the way up to publishing, where they'd hand it over to my team um, to put up on the new site. Now while writing the content took a while, and that was a big job, everything else took a lot longer. So the workflow had a number of steps. Uh, it started with obviously that team drafting it, but then they had to put it out for consultation with the business area, the sort of the subject matter experts. Uh, we then went out to an external uh, editor outside the building, professional editing. It came back for a legal review, an executive director review, and then finally it came through to us. So the whole process was handled manually, thanks to a combination of spreadsheets and email. Now with all the back and forth, uh, this took quite a while. There are a lot of moving parts, mostly because that process isn't always linear. You know, you, they would draft something, they'd send it off to the business area, the business area would tell them wrong, they'd have to redraft it. Um, sometimes you can get all the way through to the process and legal says, no, our advice was misinterpreted and you know, go back to the drawing board. So 
the process, it could move back and forth through that process quite a bit. Now, to give you some idea of the volume, this is what their project tracking spreadsheet looked like. Uh, it goes on for another 600 rows. Uh, to get an even better sense, I zoomed out, that's how many distinct items uh, of content the team was dealing with. And so for each one of those items, there were the multiple steps of the workflow, so there were over 5,000 uh, cells or steps of the workflow for them to go through. Now, as I said, it sort of had to go back and forth through that process. So um, as they were piecing together different bits of information from different emails and different Word documents that were attached, I guess you kind of get a sense for the huge amount of mental energy that went into workflowing those 400,000 words. At a guess, you know, best case, each one of those cells needs two emails, an email to the business area, an email back, for example, but um, my guess is that none of them were that simple. Uh, some would, could have taken 10. I'm just going to guess that it was 10 and say that was, you know, 50,000 emails. Um, so it was a big job. Now, on top of that, the executive wanted to get a daily summary of how this project was going. And for the executive, that's not really useful. They can't get a summary of sort of what's happening uh, with the project. So they, they, asked, they asked for something that could be sort of interpreted at a glance, uh, and basically they requested a, a dashboard. So this was another manual step. On our, on our intranet, this was published. Uh, every day, someone had to manually go through that spreadsheet, update where things were up to, send it to us, we would manually update this, this page on our intranet. Thing is though, as it turned out, the executive was quite right to keep, an eye, uh, to keep a close eye on progress of this project, because the content, it wasn't ready by deadline. It was not even close. In the end, the final bit of content reached the web team six weeks late. Launching the new uh, website was time critical for the agency. This was based around legislation. It was going to start whether we were ready or not. Uh, so the web team had to work hard. And we managed, to, uh, we managed to catch it up a bit. We launched the site just one week late. So while the web team had effectively caught up five weeks, uh, there is a cost for that. And the cost is that as we rushed to get the content in, we weren't polishing and validating our ideas on the site. So the content was all there, and in a basic sense, we'd, we'd met the requirement. Um, but the user experience just wasn't up to standard. So we hadn't really seen the content as it was coming through. We had a bit of a sense for what was coming, but we hadn't seen all of it. And so we built the site based on our best guess of what was going to be there. By the time the content had arrived six weeks late, uh, it was too late for us to change course. You know, it's really the point of no return at that point, and we couldn't really do any differently. So it was a timely reminder for us that late content has flow-on effects for a website build. While everyone else in the content development process thinks that websites just magically happen, we know that we're the ones at the end of the process with the bits of the jigsaw, and we have to put it together. So we really felt that there had to be a better way. And that was a good lesson for, for when we moved on to this next case study. Because with that first website out of the way, those first 400,000 words, we immediately moved on to redeveloping the rest of the site. Now, as I mentioned before, content management was pretty immature at the APVMA. So we had to do a content audit, and that revealed our doomsday scenario. We had 2.9 million words that needed review. Not a single one of them had a business owner assigned. Uh, worse, this time, the web team is responsible. So while the first time there was a team of four people that was uh, drafting and workflowing that content, this time it was up to us. It had a similar workflow to those first 400,000 words, but in the web team we only had one person available to do this. She's incredibly capable, but Kylie is just one person. All of this had to happen in just two months. So we couldn't really afford any efficiency, and if we had to send you know, a million emails, um, it would have sunk us, and I don't think I would have survived, to be honest. Uh, but we were in luck, because during the development of that first website, the content team had approached us with a problem. They were having trouble getting buy-in from the business areas. So they were, they, were, they were attaching their content to an email, sending it out as a Word, uh, as a Word document, um, but the business area, they were getting this resistance. The business area couldn't picture it as a website. They couldn't picture this Word document as a page on a website. So the, that content team came to us and asked, you know, can you help us with this problem? And so we agreed. We decided to build an internal prototype website uh, on a very tight time frame. We made it clear that it wouldn't look like the final website, but in my mind that was a sensible as a sort of deliberate choice because we wanted them to focus on the content, not tell us what colour the website should be. But the theory was that having this prototype site would allow the business areas to, to review the content in a web context. There'd be links and so on. 
For us, there was the added benefit of getting the content earlier. We'd see it from the early stages of drafting, um, just because it'd be coming together in this website rather than separate emails all over the place. Uh, so we did pretty well. We had the prototype up and running within a few days. Now, I'm sure that looks familiar to most of you. The default theme was suitable for our needs. As I said, it didn't need to look like our site. And so it met that, that requirement. Um, it allowed content to go in as it was available. And the user could sort of browse up and down the hierarchy and click links as they became available. But we were sort of, we thought, we've done this pretty quickly, we're on a roll. Um, we can add a bit of value here. So we saw an opportunity to add some workflow and reporting tools around each bit of content. I mean, we're building this thing anyway, so it wasn't too much of a stretch. So basically what we did is we just replicated the steps from this spreadsheet and created a real-time dashboard. Uh, the executive was pretty keen on this. They're like, that's not even going to be updated, you know, that'll be real-time, we can check that whenever. But unfortunately in the end, the team writing the content, they decided not to use the tool. And this was for reasons that I both understand <laughs> and reasons that make me die a little on the inside. But anyway, here we were a number of months later with this 2.9 million figure hanging over our heads. So we resurrected the, the prototype, we made some minor tweaks, and we used it for the entire content development workflow. And look, to, overall, I get, I've got to say it was magic. Um, using this tool, Kylie managed to defeat that doomsday scenario in just two months. And why did it work so well? I guess really, like it's pretty obvious, at its core, it, was, it operated outside of email. Uh, effectively, all the dashboard is showing us is up the top there. It's the status it's showing the, the steps in that workflow. And on the left-hand side is the number of items that are at that stage. Um, further down, we also have an overdue section where the, uh, as soon as something has, has missed its date, it pops into overdue and it makes it very obvious who's accountable because there is someone assigned to each one. Uh, this is one item of content from the tool. So everything to do with this content this bit of content from the start of the process to the very end of that workflow is stored on this node. We kept it very simple, so the content itself is up the top. Uh, we captured the metadata above that as well, so we were capturing things like the redirects. It was just going to make it easier. Once we had to put it into our actual site, having that stuff there available made it so much easier than having sort of bits of information all over the place. Uh, we also used the comments down the bottom to for all discussion about this bit of content, and we had the tracking information on the side. So effectively, the stuff that has a, I'm not sure if it's visible there, but the gray background was stuff that wasn't migrated. That was just for the purposes of developing the content, but everything in the white body area uh, was something that was going across to the new site. So the comments were used throughout for discussion and content development. So every step from, uh, from asking the business owner to, to check the content through to changes that might come through, um, down to a very important person authorising the content at the bottom, was in that one place. Uh, so we sent automatic email notifications when the status changed. They were deliberately brief, of course, so that we'd force people to actually go across to the tool to take, take their action and see what was going on. As things move through this workflow, the real-time nature of the dashboard really paid off. The progress was always clear uh, and it was always accurate. Unlike that manual dashboard on our first site, uh, both the summary and in-depth view were sort of there at the same time. It meant the CEO could jump in there and see who, where the bottleneck was and it, that really helped us to keep things moving. Every single bit of content had a clear audit trail. Um, mostly because all of that discussion and decision making was in the comments on that node attached to that bit of content. And so that increased accountability has sort of already improved our, our content, uh, our management of content. Um, one example I can give you is with that first, so with the first 400,000 words, a couple of, couple of weeks after it launched, someone from legal came around and said like, this is wrong on the site, can you, can you check this? I'm like, okay, I'll check it. Uh, I went back through, this whole process took me about 40 minutes but I checked the approved content that had been given to us, I went through it line by line, every single word was the same. And I thought, that's a QA tick, we've done what we've been asked to do. What I pieced together going back through that team's spreadsheet and the emails, and I found out later, is that legal had provided advice somewhere in the middle of the process that had somehow got lost, or someone ignored it, one or the other. But what we got at the end was just approved content. We didn't see any of that history. 
Um, so that, that took 40 minutes of my time to figure that out. Whereas with this model, that legal advice is in the middle of the thread, it's attached to the thing that's going on, it's really obvious. So it doesn't take long to sort of check those issues. We've actually referred back to this tool a number of times since launch. The, uh, the, the classic one, certainly in the first week or two after launching the site, was someone walking around and saying like, why isn't my content on the new site? And we'd go in there, we'd bring it up and say, right here, you told us to delete it. That's why it's not there. So people struggle with change and our, our agency was already pretty change fatigued. Um, we're a science-based agency as well, so there are varying levels of uh, technical um, familiarity. So um, staff didn't really have the mental energy to invest in learning a new thing uh, with so much change going on. So I guess how did we get staff to, to use this system? Well, the first thing was tough shit. If you want your content on a new site, this is the process we're using. The second thing, though, a bit more friendly, was our engagement. So whenever someone was having trouble with this tool, Kylie, she would get up, walk down to their office, sit down next to them, and just help them put it in there. And so while that took a bit of time, it was less time than spending sending two million emails. Um, by and large, I'd say it went pretty smoothly. We even had one of our executive directors call one day, and he asked me, why is it asking me to wait 3,000 seconds? And I did a bit of research and found out that he'd been approving so many of his items so quickly that it triggered the, is it Honeypot, the spam protections? <laughs> so I said, no worries, Tony, I'll just increase that. <laughs> so now that we've experienced the benefits of using a tool like this, uh, and I guess we've demonstrated a clear business case for doing so. I think going back to using email for content development would be like poking myself in the eye with a fork and probably be rusty and blunt. Um, we're a service delivery team for our agency, so a lot of what we do is routine. Um, it has, a lot of our publishing has common steps, pretty common workflow, and so we're now working and moving all of our business as usual service delivery to a similar type of model. We'll be more efficient, and we think we'll also be more sane. So I feel like it all went pretty well and we'd pulled off the improbable. We'd overcome the challenge of the original content being six weeks late. Uh, we'd improved the user experience because the first thing we pushed out was quite lacking. Um, but best of all, we def defeated that doomsday scenario. Those 2.9 million words were sorted in just two months. The site launched on time. Of course, there were a few rough edges. Uh, nearly a year later, we're still iterating and making some improvements. <coughs> But I guess the website's never finished, so I feel okay about that. The launch overall was smooth, so we felt like it was mission accomplished. Best of all, the APVMA was in a place that it hadn't been for a long time, where content wasn't previously managed at all. We can now reassure, feel reassured that every word of content on our site was current and in theory accurate, because every single word had been through a review and approval process. But how long would that last? The major content development project had gone well, but we hadn't really addressed the underlying issues that would help mature content management for the longer term. This weird thing occasionally happens to us, and at least in our web team, I'd love to hear it was elsewhere, but apparently we're experts in everything. Not long after launch, a senior member of staff came into our office with a question about a bit of content that was on the site. He wanted to know if a specific scientific requirement was correct. I don't know, I'm just the web manager. But uh, I did offer to go off and check who the business owner was and um, see if we could ask them. I went back to my desk only to discover that this senior member of staff had written the very content in question. <laughs> it turns out that business owners are quick to forget that they're the business owners. So we really need to do a better job of equipping business owners with the tools they need to manage their content. We've looked for ways to improve content management over the full life cycle. Governance is definitely an issue. Uh, we've developed a policy that sets out expectations of a business owner, but also everyone else involved in the process. And that includes us at the publishing end. There's a bit of carrot in there, but to, if I'm being honest, it's mostly stick. The CEO now gets a list of content uh, that has exceeded its review date on a regular basis. It's a pretty good motivator to do your job because you don't want to land on a desk. But the policy, the policy isn't much use without tools to accompany it. We're a small web team, so we rely on external suppliers for our Drupal development. Uh, so while considering how can, we help, how can we use Drupal to help us solve this problem, I'm always looking for simple, low-tech solutions where I can. 
So what we've started to do is display some different things. This is what we display on our front end. Uh, so we're basically displaying the content last updated date, the last reviewed date, and uh, the URL just as a bit of extra in case it's printed out. It's quite, it's quite important to have both of these things from our stakeholders' perspective. So last updated is great, um, but in, with chemical re regulation, it's also quite important to tell someone it's been reviewed recently. So it may have been updated five years ago, but someone that's investing a lot of money in registering a chemical product, it's good for them to know that someone checked it just yesterday and it's still accurate and can be relied on. The added benefit though, the nice added benefit is this is putting some pressure on our business owners. It's telling them that their review matters. We're gonna tell stakeholders that they've checked it and it's up to date. So it's a little bit extra for our, our, uh, our business owners as well. This is just an alternate display of the same thing. The only thing that's added here is a version history. So we don't add this to every page. It doesn't really make sense on like a contact page or something like that. So we don't need to show, you know, that a phone number used to be X and now it's Y. Um, but there are some bits of content on our site. There are these quite lengthy uh, scientific guidelines. And on, on the old site, they used to be trapped inside PDFs as these big publications, and now we've, we've managed to get them to HTML. Um, but it is quite valuable for our stakeholders to see uh, a version history on those, mostly because um, it's, the change could be something quite minor in the middle, seemingly minor in the middle, but it's, you know, it's, it's one letter difference in a scientific formula or something, and it you know, costs them $100,000. So that's why with those, we've added a version history as well. Uh, this is how that data looks in the back end. And it's dead simple. Um, as, I, as I said, as a small team, I was just looking for simple ways. Uh, they're effectively just fields on the content type. We're updating all of those manually. Um, I'm hoping someone will pop up with an amazing way to do this automatically later. But the problem that I was considering was that uh, not every action on a node um, should change these values. You know, if we're just removing a full stop or correcting uh, a broken link or something, that's not, an up, that's not updating the page as far as our stakeholders are concerned. So at this stage, we're just updating um, all of those fields manually as we go. Uh, this here is just a view that we've created to help us manage this review process. Uh, again, it's pretty simple. There are no automatic emails that are going out to business owners. At this stage, my team is just coordinating this. Um, what we are doing is we're using this view to find what is due for review, and then we advise the, uh, advise the business owner that it is due. Um, it's just, you know, obviously there are some filtering tools there, and um, we're just able to sort it and see what's due. Uh, and it's pretty easy for us at a glance to see where things are up to. So what have we learned from our journey? Well, I think for me, that's just the way it is, is a terrible reason to do something. Just because email is there, just because Outlook is open all day and staring us in the face, just because it's comfortable and familiar, doesn't mean that email is the answer to everything. Thank you for listening to my rant. <laughs> We did it manually. Um, so what we did, uh, get back to. Um, so you can see right down the bottom, we've got a status that was, uh, I think, migrate no further changes. We did do it manually. We initially um, were looking at is the migrate module. I think we sort of had that sort of deployed, but it was all a bit complex um, for what we needed it to do. And effectively, all this was was a workflow up to that point. So the content that was in this 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 tool wasn't necessarily, didn't necessarily have clean markup. You know, it could have gone in with the WYSIWYG and been bastardized the whole way through. So in my view, at the end of the process, someone in the web team was always gonna to be touching it to clean it up. And we thought at that stage, if we're doing that, we'll just, we'll just migrate it manually. It just kept it much simpler. No, we've, um, we're getting closer to that on our internal property uh, for um, just for the intranet, but for our public website, no. We just, um, uh, we get enough Word documents that are in bad shape to, to let people get out there and start hacking away at, at, at web pages. It's just, it's just not realistic, especially in government with our accessibility requirements. 
Um, so really, we have a, a centralized web team for publishing for mostly that reason, just a quality control. <laughs> We're supposed to be double A. <laughs> So this, this tool, uh, we did develop it, but it, I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. It's effectively a Drupal site with some views. Like, that's about all it is. Uh, I think the rules module was used to do oh, the notifications. Uh, yeah, I think, I know, rules, what else was there? But I mean, it's, it's very simple. It's a, it's, it's a single content type with some fields on it and then views that surface that. Um, I guess the, the follow-up question would be like, you know, we could have done this with any number of tools. We could have used Redmine or or something like that. It's effectively just an issue tracker, um, just a little bit more customized for us. The reason I did this is because um, I had the infrastructure available for Drupal. So it takes a lot of energy and time for IT to provision other infrastructure for us. Um, so because I had infrastructure to do Drupal sites, we had a Drupal developer, we just did it. They're pretty happy to just send us whatever they've got on paper and hope it works out okay. Um, no, I think we have we actually have the opposite problem. We need to we need to push back more, and um, part of our governance is that we'll we'll only be accepting content that meets uh, a certain standard. So they've got to, it's got to meet our language guide, our style guide, and all that stuff before it reaches us. I don't think um, certainly on our intranet internally people do want to be able to go and post their own news items and that sort of stuff. But um, we haven't had any resistance to to the web, I guess on, on the public side, on the public site you do, do have arguments with people about where their content is placed. Um, but for the most part it hasn't been too bad. They, they sort of trust that you know, we're, the, you know, we're the subject matter experts on a, an inter, internet, ar internet architecture and so they let that fly. We've, you know, the other day I pushed back on putting a new button on the home page, that's the mm -hmm. common one. Um, but generally it's pretty good. Question. Um, I think, so our agency has, has gone through a lot of change and for me the biggest measure initially was how many complaints we got on day one and luckily it was pretty quiet. Um, I think for our stakeholders the issue is they were being hit with a new system um, so their, the regulatory environment was changing and they were getting a new website as well so we were definitely worried about interface shock uh, but on, on day one to, to only be sort of cleaning up minor things we thought that was pretty good. Um, we have uh, what we call a super user group available. So these are some, some people um, from our industry uh, that we've put in a room a couple of times to do a bit of uh, validation with. Um, that's been the main mechanism by which we keep an eye on it. I mean, I keep an eye on the stats, of course, the Google Analytics and so on, but I'd say that the biggest validation we've had is this super user group, which is about between five and 10 people from the industry. Um, I've been a little bit lucky on the website because uh, most of the problems that, that the um, that our stakeholders are facing are actually with the other half of our website, which is developed by an IT team. So I've escaped fairly, um, fairly well through this process, I guess. So we have had some usability issues. As I said, when we first put up the, um, the very first 400,000 words, that, that, at that time that was a site for consultation, and so the feedback that we got through the consultation was we got slammed, um, and it was completely valid. We could see that straight away. So that was a really bad deployment. Um, and so we then just staged it so that by the time the site moved out of consultation, it became official business. You know, we, we got it to a point we thought we were pretty comfortable with those super users. We put it out there and a couple of months after it launched, we went back to the super users with our next round of iterations and tested that. So does that help? I'm hoping it will. I'd say it hasn't yet. Um, so we're to the point where we've got this the new policy sort of set out, but the the tools um, 
the tools that we provide to help them give us good content aren't quite there yet. So it's still it's still a lot of effort for them to go off and read a big style guide. Um, simple stuff like give us your you know, leap track changes on when you're giving us edits, please. That sort of stuff. It's still not consistent. And by um, switching to a, hopefully a tool like this with a web form on the front um, will help help that. So we'll sort of force it to come in via a funnel, but we've got a long way to go. Thanks, everyone.